Welcome to Songwriters from Here and Away. This is a show that focuses on new and established songwriters from Atlanta, Canada, across Canada, and around the world. Hello, and thanks for tuning in to Songwriters from Here and Away. I'm Robert Campbell, and this week we have three songwriters in the room. These are professional songwriters. They've been writing for a number of years together. Lucy LeBlanc, I've known for many years, have written a few songs with her. Bill O'Hanlon and Paul DeMarco. They get together every week, and they have hundreds of songs, thousands between them, and they are quite successful with their sync work and with getting cuts by artists and that kind of thing. We talk about their process a little bit and we share some of their songs. So I'll jump right into the chat and throughout the hour you will hear music. How have you guys been writing together as a trio? That's a good question. What do you think? Three, four years? Three years? Four years? I'd say four, yeah, probably four years now. I right. can find out exactly, but yeah. Yeah. And you've been lately, I noticed that you've been getting together virtually every week or more often than once a week. Is that right? Yeah. Once a every week. week. Yeah. Once a week. Every week. Once a week. We kind of started that right away. Uh, right. We, we gelled right away. Um, we were. Uh, it came about because uh, I'm a member of Songtown, so mm -hmm. is Bill, so is Paul. And uh, Songtown's run by Marty Dodson and Clay Mills. Mm -hmm. And Clay Mills um, sent an email to Paul and I and saying that he thought perhaps uh, we would be good writing together and introduced us to each other right? and uh, uh, told me what Paul's capable of, which is Everything, everything, <laughs> artist, producer, songwriter, the works. And he has and a new me, which is mostly just lyrics. But right. Paul, uh, Bill, uh, uh, that Clay also said that uh, Lucy sets up three way co writes and should, so she'll probably bring in someone else. And right. I got hold of Bill, said, Would you like to be our third? And that's how it started. Great. Right. So it's not everybody that can write together. So you guys have gelled. Uh, I've had co-writes with one and two, three other people where it just hasn't worked. And that writing combination has never happened again because of that. What do you think makes the difference for you guys being together for this long? How does it fit? How does that work? It's a, it's a little like dating. It's a little like getting married or relationship. It's hard to say. There's just a chemistry. I did look it up because you asked. Our first song we wrote in August of 2019, it was called Designs on You. That song turned out so well. That was our first hit. And Lucy actually submitted it to a songwriter um, competition in Texas. And that song won. Uh, the, that I think, Lucy, you can tell that better than I. Um, yeah, I I can't remember if uh, it it was in the the rock version. Actually, when we I'm going to back up a whole lot. That first first song we rock, wrote, Bill came in with an idea, and maybe Paul, you can expound on that that idea. Remember what that Bill brought in? Yeah, I do. I I remember because one thing that I think is really important and interesting, which I think is you're talking about the ingredients why we work. All I can say is in the room when we're together, and it's a virtual room because we're all in different parts of the world, uh, there's this level of trust, which which is unusual because it wasn't necessarily earned trust because we didn't know each other before um, as, as, a, as a three. Um, but there's this level of trust where we we speak very freely in the room, which makes songwriting really easier to do because everyone just says what they feel, says what they think, uh, and we're all considerate of that. So I remember Bill coming into the room, and Bill, you'd just been to uh, the opticians, right? Right. I'd like so to, yeah. Bill had just been to the to the opticians to the to get his eyes uh, to get his eyes checked, and as the optician, as the optometrist reached over him to do something, he noticed she was like covered in tattoos, oh. and um, and he was like, "I wonder what this girl's story is." You know, she's covered in tattoos, and it he just wasn't expecting it. I think in that so, sort of setting, so we we just started 
with that idea. And uh, this girl had designs on her, you know, tattoo designs, right. and wondered what what the story was. So we kind of combined our life stories in relationships and things and and came up with this accumulative story of a guy who goes into a coffee shop and as the girl's serving him she reaches up for something and he sees this tattoo on her shoulder of a broken heart with wings and he just thinks wow what does that mean what's what's her story and and that was the uh, that was the birth of the song that was our first song so it was uh, yeah it came together Right now, I'm going to play four versions of the song, but the first three, just snippets of Designs on You. First one will be the Americana version, then a country pop version, then a rock version, then the acoustic version. So you get an idea of what they did with the four takes. I think it's quite fascinating, and it's a great song. Here it is. Designs on you. I want to see some more. I've got designs on you, too. You're making this broken heart sore. Who knew the love could start with a torn tattoo? Got designs on you. Story. Who left that mark on you? Tell me who broke your heart. How did you rise above it? How did you make it through? There's a mystery about you now. You've got an earth. 
underneath my skin somehow I want to learn everything about those angel wings And uncover who you really are You've got designs on you I want to see some more I've got designs on you too You're making this broken heart sore you got designs on you Oh, I want to see some more I've got designs on you too You're making this broken heart sore Who knew that love could start with a tone tattoo Got designs on you Designs on you Designs on you You got designs on you Years ago when uh, I started co-writing I took a co-writing class through a song town and they said Figure out what your strengths are. And and I had written songs on my own before. So I did lyrics and I did melody. And, you know, so I thought, you know, what are my, I do it all. I play an instrument. I play a couple of instruments. And, but as time went on and as I wrote with more and more people, it, it emerged that usually my strengths are two, maybe three. One is I usually bring an idea. And almost for a few years, almost every time I wrote with a couple of other people, we'd use my idea because sometimes the other people would bring ideas too. Um, secondly, I write lyrics very fast. And it's funny because Lucy and I both write lyrics and, you know, Paul, again, again, sometimes I write melody and I bring in melodies to the three of us. But Lucy and I, for some reason, we work really well together on melodies. She's a little more precise than I am, and I'm a little more quick. <laughs> Let's just right. say that. <laughs> and so sometimes I go on so fast, I don't even, you know, I don't even stop to edit. And so she's good at like, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense here. Or we were using you, not I, you know, and right. things like that. And then maybe because I used to be a therapist, I'm pretty good at bringing the best out in people. And Lucy's really good at doing rooms, creating rooms. And Paul's, as Lucy said, has created everything. He plays instruments, you know, guitar and piano and bass. And, you know, he, right. he's just a great singer and he's a great writer. And, you know, so he brings that all. And for some reason, the, it's, as I said, like chemistry, it just gels with the three of us. And we, we all have um, other people that we write with. And sometimes this is magical, but for the three of us, it's magical. After about four sessions together, we got together one time, we had a brief for a sync thing, and it was about a Western setting. And Paul brought in a couple of ideas. I brought in a couple of ideas, and we wrote five songs in less than three hours. And right. four of those songs, I think, have been signed to the sync uh, things. And so it was just like, you don't find that very often. So we started to make it a more regular thing. Well, I've, I've seen some of the posts about uh, how, how you guys have, you know, had some success with sync and with artists cutting tracks and whatnot. It's uh, a tribute to the stick with itness concept. Paul, I, I listened to a number of the songs. I listened to all the songs that Lucy shared. And I noticed, Paul, that you're doing a lot of the production and singing on virtually all of them, I guess. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes and, we have a female singer that we, we use. Right. So that really helps when you want to be able to shop something around for sync or to an artist. So you're the kind of the in-house producer, right? Do you yeah. guys ever send it out for um, someone else to do that stuff? Or do you just generally always do that, Paul? I think I think there's there, there was a couple of times where we've where we've looked for different singers. Um and but but pretty much I think we've pretty much done everything in in house you know because the the interesting thing is apart from when we've hired uh female vocalists there are limits to my abilities um <laughs> and um what we found was there was nothing wrong with the singers that were doing the songs but there's something about writing the song and then singing it which carries weight 
Right. That it's really that there are singers who. I was thinking um, over here in Wales, we've got Sir Tom Jones, who uh, incredible singer. Elvis Presley, for example. There are exceptions where people can take somebody else's song and sing it, and you and you believe it. But what we noticed was when I sang the song, uh, regardless of whether you like my voice or not, or or whether it was a perfect vocal or not, uh, we found that it was it was believable. You know, because right. I I felt every single word that I was singing. I was part of the writing process. Often it's my story and Lucy and Bill embellish it. Sometimes it's their story and I embellish it. But there's there's little pieces of all of us in every in every song. Right. So I can really relate when the song gets performed. So it just made sense to just keep it in house. Also, what helps with that is quite often we'll be pitching a song. We have a, we got a song called best damn day of my life. And we pitched that to a, to a sync supervisor and he said, love it. It's great. But the only problem is there are certain markets that wouldn't like the word damn. That's great. We'll play that song right now. You're listening to Songwriters from Here and Away, and we're in the room with Lucy LeBlanc, Paul DeMarco, and Bill O'Hanlon, three writers who get together every week and write great tunes. I'd like to mention that this show and other events that we're doing are sponsored by East Coast Realty. So if you're looking for sales or purchasing of properties in the Atlantic region or maybe across Canada, Give them a call because they've been helping us and we can help them. East Coast Realty Limited. Before we go on, I'd like to mention sfhaa.ca. sfhaa.ca for songwriters from here and away. We have all sorts of the previous broadcasts and other information about concerts that we do. And we also have a Patreon, so look up sfhaa on Patreon. And a join there, it can be free, and we will be having live streams and all that. 
Here we go back to Lucy, Paul, and Bill. My question was on that song. It's funny that you mentioned that because I was wondering about the origin of the tune, and I, and I kind of like the out of tune sort of horns on it, right? That that loose horn sound that you yeah. that you captured. Yeah. But and and the word "damn" is a really light expletive. But yeah. do you guys think about that at the time, like when you're in the room at that moment, you're you're parsing out whether you should use that word or 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 not or darn or how do you? So how did you deal with that? We didn't think about it until a supervisor gave us feedback, but now we do since we've gotten that feedback. Um, the other thing is, Paul, when you write with Paul, Paul has certain words that feel right in his mouth. And we'll, Lucy and I are mostly lyrics, and we're writing lyrics, and he'll say, no, that that doesn't feel right in my mouth, or I can't sing it well. You know, it doesn't right. sing well. And so that word just did it. But yeah, we could make a different version because Paul has the original tracks and he sung it. Just the best day of my, instead of the best damn day of my life. So we're very cognizant of that for sync because sometimes you have to censor yourself a little to make sure you get in a commercial. They don't want the word damn in a commercial. It might be in a TV show or a movie. That would be fine. But but on, on the original right, the word was really important because the the origin of the song was it was it was during lockdown and um i had this like, everybody was complaining about lockdown and everyone was saying oh i can't go to the pub i can't see my family i can't see my friends i can't do this i can't go to work and yes. and i and i just decided well we've been given the gift of time you know so how do i go through this however long this period's going to be yeah. do i do i fight it do i complain about it and i just decided i was going to wake up every morning and make it the best damn day of my life so the word damn was kind of important because it it wasn't an expletive we don't tend to use them but it was almost like an emphasis uh right. the best day of my life no the best damn day of my life right. so it was kind of an added an added thing to that idea, you know. Well, and, and we the all alliteration is good too, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah, we all love that stuff. And the three of us are psychotically optimistic, so we, we tend to go for those positive songs. After we got that feedback about not having the word in there, we do have a version with the word taken out. Sure, but it's just not as to me, it's not as effective, if you will. Right. And and then Paul decided to do a ska version. I was wondering about that. It's a, it's like the the uh, the punk tune that I guess re did recently. So wonderfully weird. <laughs> yeah. That's that's so that's my one of my favorites. Uh, Paul can really go UK uh, punk and and yeah. um, sometimes cool. rap and grime, and so it's cool. Spins me out, then she swallows 
in the case of the So Wonderfully Weird, was that a, a, a pitch that you saw a sync request come through, a brief? No, I I don't think it was. It, it was eventually. It, it was all oh, yeah. quite often we'll write something before a brief arrives. Like we don't know the brief is coming right. and then we write a song anyway. So we wrote that song. I had this idea. I've been listening to a band called The Hives and, you know, right. I, I teach at a, at a rock school and oh, I do lots of different songs with the kids and we had this high energy punk thing. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have a high energy punk song? And and so we write that. And then I think the following week I was in Liverpool away for the, for the weekend and this brief arrived and I was like out the studio and I'd messaged Bill and Lucy and said, this Briefs come out wonderfully weird's perfect for it can you deal with it you know so it was almost as if we we have this theory that when that songs arrive you know and that all you need to do is have your antenna up you just got to be listening and when the song arrives you got to capture it and then it'll it'll have some purpose in in some way some place and uh, in this particular case literally a week later the brief arrived so sometimes the brief comes we write the song sometimes we write the song and the brief comes (laughs) well the synchronicity of that is great and and so just to to clarify so for people who may not know the biz a brief is when a advertising company or a record company or a artist or production house or whatever uh, goes looking for a certain type of song. How do those come to you, and how has that changed now that you now that you've gotten some more success? I imagine you have those direct connections too. So uh, we're all members of Songtown, and through Songtown, they have different groups, and they call them the Edge groups. Right. And we we uh, uh, both Bill and I are in the Sync group, and within the Sync group, there are two di- two different groups one of which is called the sync up and the sync up group gives you live briefs as they receive them. So uh, you will get a live brief, but normally those briefs are due very quickly. Lots of times you won't have time to sit down and write the song if it's due within the day or within four hours. But if you've got a few days or a week, well, you can, you can, you can do that. So that is, um, one I've been in for for a number of years. Another one um, we we got a brief as, as Lucy says. Usually the timeline is very quick. It's two hours, one day, maybe two days, maybe a week. And we got a brief from Chantelle Ogden, who's a sync agent, and she said, well, "There's this indie movie that's called Love in Tahiti, and they're looking for a song." And we wrote a song. As our usual on our usual weekly thing, Paul produced it overnight. And because he's in the UK, we could, Lucy and I got it in the morning and we could get it in by the next day when it was due. And that song was placed in the movie Love in Tahiti. And it was the first song in the movie. And it's called No Ceiling. I think you have it actually. Sunshine and skyline lead the way Dive into the deep blue and find your place Don't underestimate, take a firm hold of your space Don't hesitate Make everything 
That's uh, Paul on the production of that. It's sequenced a bit, eh? You, you like you got the underlying sequencer thing going on. So what I what I used for that, yeah, I used um, uh, uh, arpeggio, you know, arpeggiators. Right. So I had a I had a I had a plugin which was like it works like an old synth, uh, right. and I was just kind of um, uh, yeah getting that to work. Um, guitars are real. Uh, and then kind of, it's almost like a synth wave thing, kind of synth wave meets, um, meets like pop, you know? Right. Well, I, I, I on the intro, like on the guitar, uh, the keyboard guitar part, uh, it's kind of got this wacky out of tune thing going on, like it, this really neat conflict. And I love that. Right. And I didn't know what to think. And now, I, I mean, I guess I'd have to see the song in the movie, to see how it sits in the in the placement, right? Uh, for for where you set where it got used. Go on Amazon, you can uh, rent it. But go ahead, Paul. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that a, a, a soup, one super because all supervisors, everything they say is is subjective. You know, they they kind of look at it from different angles. And one supervisor said, "Oh yeah, the guitar sounds slightly out of tune. You might want to fix that." So, um, and it was funny because I had I, I I follow my gut a lot. So I was listening to the to the to the original version, and I I knew it was slightly out, but I kind of liked it. It gave it this weird chorusy effect. So yeah, I yeah. so I left it. Anyway, supervisor gives some feedback. So I went, okay, fine. Fine, let's do that. So I went back and I, I I played the guitars again, retuned it and everything. It was rubbish. It just didn't, it just didn't feel the same. Um, I, I heard a really good story of um, Jimmy Page was in the studio with a producer, Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin, and he was recording some guitar parts and um, he decided to retire for the evening. He went upstairs to bed and the producer just was tidying up the tracks, you know, bringing things into line and kind of, there was a few sloppy timing bits. So he put them, you know, lined everything up so it sounded better. Right. Jimmy Page came downstairs the next day and said, throw up those tracks. I just want to have a listen to what was recorded last night so he starts playing it and jimmy page jumps out of his seat and screams stop the tape stop the tape what did you do and the guy was like what do you mean what did i do he said it sounds wrong what did you do he said i just line things up and put things in 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 order and he said well put them back <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. the idea is that those imperfections are what we love about the songs that we love right. and that was a that was a great example yeah out of tune guitars it works yeah. AI will never be Paul with a slightly out of tune guitar. That's right. Find them all the way. That's one of the topics that I had, the whole concept of AI and how you see that impacting what you guys do or the industry in general, because I just it's a big train rolling down the track that one no one really knows which switch is gonna get pulled and where that train is going, right? Well, I all I have to say is in our writing room. We will, we will never need AI because we've got Bill. You would not believe how fast those words and lines come out. I'll, of I'll do it's a John amazing. Henry. I'll do a John Henry thing and go up against ChatGTP for writing lyrics uh, to a song. Mine will make more sense, and I'll be just as fast. A friend of mine just said, "We are AI." I have sixty-eight years of stuff going in my ears and 60 years of stuff going out of my fingers but it's still an a it's it's still an intelligence machine putting out the stuff so i think this is very apropos to to mention that you have three intelligence machines collaborating and feeding each other and i think it's a very 
unique and incredible thing that that AI will not be able to achieve for decades. Well, we'll never be able to achieve the emotion. Maybe. You know, well, it, it, it's, yeah. it's three people together. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're kind of thinking like one brain, but more than that, you're you, you're sharing one heart. And that heart right. is what's going to bring out the emotion. And tell me, will AI ever be able to feel it? Yeah, that's I a think question we can't answer. I feel. Oh, I think that's right. Until it evolves, and we'll see. But yeah, I think what we're really doing with music is we're putting emotion to a rhythm and a melody. And I think you know that emotion is so grounded in people's bodies. Like Paul, when we were writing, it was like that doesn't feel right in my mouth. Now you know, unless you're an AI robot who's got some sort of sensory um, program like that, you're not going to be able to say that. And also the wonderful accidents. So like, you know, when jazz players play the wrong note and then they play it over again and it becomes part of the solo, yeah. it, there's a little of that accidental, like you say, you know, you're taking input all the time. We get ideas everywhere. Lucy is really good at listening. So mm -hmm. we'll be talking and she'll go, well, we ought to write that. That's the song we ought to write. Forget these ideas we were just talking about. Right. Lucille said, you just said this, or we just said this, or this is what happened. We got to write that song. So it's that randomness and accidental stuff that when you get to perfection, that's uh, that can be a little problematic because right. machines are good at getting to perfection and right. humans are good at messiness, I think, and emotion. Yeah, yeah. Well, as three gentlemen in a room with a woman with a superlative wordsmithing uh, we can all give a nod to lucy leblanc i know that for sure and she's written what? millions probably hundreds of thousands of words and songs by now yeah yeah we love you lucy just Aww. just gotta say that i don't necessarily keep that in the show but you know uh, yeah, we, <laughs> we really should. Do. That's right. If I could just backtrack a little bit, right down back to the the very first song that we wrote, yeah. that designs on you, Paul right away created three different versions of that song in a production. One was a rock production, one was country, and one was um, Americana. And we put it out on on Facebook. Hey, here's this production. What do you think? Here's another production. What do you think? And people would weigh in on their favorites. And it wasn't unanimous. People, some people this, some people that, some people. For me, I gravitated to the rock one. And then there was this little song contest at Austin, in Austin, Texas, the Austin Songwriters. And I submitted that for the rock group. And yeah, it won an award there. Right. So <laughs> You're listening to Lucy LeBlanc, Paul DeMarco, and Bill O'Hanlon. Three writers, one from Vancouver area, one from the United States, and one from UK. The different versions, have they been picked up in, in various versions or just? I do a lot of pitching and I go with what my gut tells me. And for me, it's the rock version. So that has been that has been signed by a sync agent, the rock version. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. the one I gravitate to. That's the one I <laughs> I pitch, right? right. And well, and the the interesting thing with that as well is because the rock version was was pitched and obviously it's the, it's the master of the track and the, and the lyrics that they that they sign, uh, but we we kind of held back on pitching the other two because the lyrics were exactly the same. However, uh, we had a brief come in wanting a particular type of lyric, and we actually used the track from the Americana version to create a completely brand new song with a uh, completely new lyric. And uh, and that that came out that came out really well. I also play the song live acoustic, and I do it a, a fourth way. I do it completely different when I play right. it live. And here's that song. It's called "Same Old Round and Round," and it's built on top of the bed track that we heard earlier for the song "Designs on You," the Americana version. Same old round and round. Drive to the warehouse and clock myself in 
Another soul sucking shit begins. The hours go by in an endless hum. Unloading stack boxes until it's lunch. Rinse and repeat and wish for quitting time. Think I'm going out of my mind. Would you believe? Dust off my feet and get out of this town. Who knows why it didn't happen for me? No, it's just the same old, same old round and round. I think this kind of thing for songwriters, um, especially writing independently, a solo writer, not doing co-writes and not getting into the production end of stuff. It's very easy for us to navel gaze and not um, not mm. get outside our comfort zones of styles and production and ideas. And we all have our crutches that we rest on when we write. But I think it would be great to experience some of that variety to see that yeah, you move outside the comfort zone, right? I had a, I had someone ask me, one of my songwriting partners asked me, because uh, we're supervisor, music supervisor for TV and movies, commercials, was asking for clean rap songs. And he said, well, come on, you're the lyric guy. Will you write a rap song? I said, no, I will not write a rap song with you. I don't, <laughs> I listen to a little of it, but not that much. And he twisted my arm and I ended up having a good time. And then I brought Lucy in for the next one. And we wrote a rap song with the same guy. And then yeah. Paul and Lucy and I have written some rap songs. It's kind of nice to be pulled out of your comfort zone, as you say, and out of your usual patterns to do something that really stretches you. And the nice part about, you know, like I'll write one song a year by myself, just to remind myself I can do it. But I love co-writing. And what I love about it is that it pulls me into new directions, that kind of synergy of two or three people writing a song. And the other thing is you got three people putting that song out in the world. You know, that, you know, because it's a lonely business. All right. And I say it takes a village to get a song out in the world. It sure. takes a village to produce it. It takes a village to pitch it. It takes a village to um, write it and um, and all that stuff. So I actually love this kind of team, the, this kind of team that we have. I never thought that 
back, blind myself to the vibes, but now I'm drinking down a bucket of pride. Been high on life and I'm flying inside. Hey, hey, hey. what you say? Kind of sound, gonna bring it around, and I'm bound to show you how. Open your eyes and watch me now. I'm down with the house, I'll be saying it loud. This is Daddy O by the Doll Group, of course, and that's Paul DeMarco singing. We call ourselves Doll, which is based on our last uh, initials, right. and we, we use two of Lucy's. But you know, it's Paul DeMarco, Bill O'Hanlon, and Lucy LeBlanc. She gets two, two yes. because she, she's yeah. the writer, she's the lyric person, so she gets that. I, um, I was looking. Yeah. I was looking at the name and I realized that you have uh, all three of you have a uh, syllable last name De Marco LeBlanc, you know. So, oh, Hanlon. Oh, Hanlon, yeah, it's all the of. It's all right? the all of. three oh, of yeah. and I thought, man, you couldn't have planned that better. Uh, I don't notice that. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ask Paul a question if you don't mind. Yeah. You mentioned when you're playing a Designs on You live, you do a different version. What would you call that version that you're doing live? Well, it's it's at my acoustic gigs, and every single recording of the song that we've got is kind of more full production. And and I think it's a really good test of a song, the fact that it, you can sit down with a guitar or a piano and play it, and it still works as a song. So I, I, I'll i be honest with you, Lucy, I don't really know, because I think I play it slightly differently every time I play it. I just, I pick up the guitar, and I'm sometimes fast, sometimes slow. The chords don't really change, but um, it, it, it moves, so I just I just tell the story.
Paul DeMarco singing On the Wrong Side, written by the Doll Group. Look up sfhaa.ca. You'll find it all there. Well, I have to say thank you to Paul because I just got my um, my BMI uh, uh, earnings this quarter, and Paul's been playing some of our songs out, and those are showing up on my BMI statements, and they're adding to my BMI statements. I play songs out as well, and so I get some of that live performance uh, royalty. And Paul's been doing a great job. He's out there two or three times a week uh, playing with on his own or with a group that he has. And sometimes our songs show up on that list and you right. can make a lot of money. Again, another reason to write with other people. They may go out and play your songs. They may record them and release them. Lucy and I have had a bunch of songs released that were recorded and released by our co-writers. That's mm-hmm. the easiest way, as they say, writing with artists. Right. Paul's. Paul's an artist. We write with Jan um, Edwards, who's another artist, and she puts out stuff a lot. And so that helps us get our music out in the world. And again, that co-writing thing has been so essential for my learning about how to be a better songwriter. Right. Not only in the room, you don't get caught in your own head and is this yeah. good? Is this right? But you also get the feedback right there. Somebody goes, eh, I don't know, that line seems kind of cheesy, or wait a minute, we changed the rhyme scheme for the first verse. <laughs> That's not right. That, that <laughs> raises a question I had. How do you um, resolve those differences of opinion? So how do you deal with those little issues in the room? You've made it to the podcast. This is the extended version, and I will basically let the interview run as it was recorded and insert some of the tracks. I really appreciate you being here and making it this far. Your support is greatly appreciated. Would love to have you join the mailing list and the online community. So check us out, and thank you, thank you, thank you. Here we go. How do you deal with those little issues in the room? We fight. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll find the people that are flexible, number one, that right. don't go, this is the way it has to be. N- none of us ever say. Sometimes we're strongly advocating for, no, I really love this line. I really want this word to be in there. But we're all flexible enough to let it go. And as right. somebody, one, some writer, Hemingway or somebody said, be willing to kill your babies. Right. You know, the things that you think are the coolest lines, but don't quite work for other people or don't quite serve the song. So uh, that's what I would say. What would you two say? What would you say, Lucy? Well, 
if someone is very, very passionate about it, I usually bow to the passion. They, they've got a driving reason they want it, as you know. But that's one of the good things about writing in a group of three. If one doesn't want it, the other two do. Wow. Right. It's a democracy. Win, don't they? It's a democracy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You already yeah. win. Sometimes. But again, yeah. sometimes that person with the passion will override the, the democracy. Yes. Yeah. That's true. That, that's true. Or you can make the case. Sometimes I'm a really good talker, as you've noticed, and I will make a case. Here's why I think this is the way we should do it. And sometimes they'll go, oh, okay, that makes sense. And I'll be able to I'll be able to talk my way into that. You can line. baffle them with BS, right? Yeah. That's, 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 that's my specialty. <laughs> I mean, it is it is a co-write. I mean, you know, it's not just sure. you, right? So yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's a, a blending together. Right. And yeah. and creating something magical and special, actually. That's Paul DeMarco singing on Soul Revival, written by the Doll Group. Well, I mean, in a case, you know, most of the time we really, it is really a blend. But sometimes one person, Lucy, will write a whole lyric. Or Paul will bring in a whole song. And then you know, this is our joke between the three of us, because when we first started writing with Paul, 
he would play us this thing that he'd just written to bring to the session. And Lucy and I would look at him and say, Paul, that is just stunningly beautiful and well what, done. What are we what doing here? The, yeah. What no, what is the song about? We would oh, say. Yeah. It feels great. But we have no idea what this song is about. And you go, well, it's about this. And then Lucy and I, we get to work like little mice, chewing right. out some of those words and changing them so well, that so that everyone who could hear who heard it would understand what he just told us. Right. Because we got the feeling, but we didn't get the sense of it. So right. that's, you know, sometimes we'll bring in a whole thing. Sometimes I'll bring in one small idea and we expand it into a song. And again, that's the joy and the the surprise of co-writing. You never know what's going to turn into a song. Right. Yeah, it's a and some of those it. songs have become my favorite songs in the world, not right. of my songs. My favorite songs. I'll find myself walking around my house singing or whistling a song and then I'll realize Oh, that's a song that I co-wrote with these guys. It's great. I love that. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You know, the um, the idea of placement uh, is something that I notice a, a lot of novice or uh, less experienced songwriters fall into or fall out of. They don't they don't put themselves in the positions uh, as an observer of who's singing. What are they saying and to whom and where are those people situated both uh, physically, but emotionally and kind of psychologically, right? So that the, the song can deliver to the listener all those pieces without having to, you know, if you go to a songwriter circle, great. I Here's a song about me singing a song, you know, or whatever. People in, introduce stuff and they, they give away the whole song and, and okay, fine, I can listen to that song. But if I can't listen to the song uh, without all that preamble or all that pre-knowledge, then it's, it's to me, it's not a completed song, right? Yeah. Agreed. I, I remember something Marty Dodson said, and Marty's one of the songwriters hitting up uh, at the top of uh, uh, Songtown. He said, the first verse should accomplish three things establish the characters the context and the setting yep yeah. and i try to remember that when we're, we're writing yeah and there, got, there's, there's a lot there's a lot to write in and you got uh, four, to, four to eight lines to do it yeah uh -huh. and right. the first line has to draw you right in not not just lyrically but also right. melodically right. so that the listener keeps on listening mm -hmm. and it has to yeah. drip on down through the song yeah. Yeah. And I keep that, that yeah. listener I've heard, engaged. Yeah. I've heard that before too, is that when you hear a great song, you think, wow, that's so simple and so clear. I could write something like that. And then you try it and it's not that easy to write something that's yeah. so clear and so simple and compelling, hooky. Yeah. And there are so many things go into it. We pay attention to every syllable. Yeah of every word, alliterations, you know, the rhythm of that, where it falls in the phrase. Right. There's a lot that goes into great songwriting. The prosody I, and the prosody yeah. syntax and all that stuff. Um, Absolutely. The, uh, the thing I always say, is pe people talk about that, and I say, well, just if it's that easy, just go out and try to write a Hank Williams song. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know? They seem so simple. That's a great example. Right. Hank Williams. It's so simple. It's three chords, and it's so simple. Yeah. And then you go write, and you go, "I can't do that. That There's, is genius." It's, it's genius. two or three syllable words is the max. You know, it's yeah, like, that's right. Yeah, what? <laughs> yeah. I whipper uh, will and, now. Come on, whipper will. That's that's a, oh, that's yeah, a complicated really. word in a Hank Williams. Right? I have a uh, tendency, as Lucy knows, to have uh, sometimes more chords than one needs. Uh, and and you have to you have to really watch that. I noticed that you've got the tune on the wrong side, which is basically a two chord jam. And I noticed how it all comes down to. Uh, in that case, it's all about the production and the groove and the and and then of course the, the lyrics and what you're doing on top of it. So where did that tune come from for you guys? Where did that go? that was that was a really exciting thing because Paul is such a good singer. And he got laryngitis and we had a brief due. And that was song was written to a brief. 
And oh. Paul had a great track, and he sent it to me. I was on an island in the Caribbean, and I went out in oh, the morning. Poor guy. And uh, and I was – that's one of the few that I've written the melody for because Paul had laryngitis and couldn't do it. So usually I just defer to him because he's such a good melody writer and such a good singer. And I sang my croaky version of it into a, into an iPhone and sent it to him. And when he recovered, he was able to sing it. And uh, Lucy and I fixed the lyrics from my initial, you know, rough right. one. And uh, it fit the brief perfectly. It didn't get placed, unfortunately. But after that, it got into the soundtrack for a movie. Great. There you go. Good. Well, um, I really enjoyed. I really enjoy the songs. Um, where? What was? Uh, oh, we are. We are fragile. We are fragile. That's a lovely tune. Cool I, concept, and I love the. Uh, I love the space between the lines, right? It, I state something here and I wait. Yeah. And I state something again and it gives us the chance to process, you know, and it's almost too long for me, right? I was going, okay, right? So how did that one come about? That's all Paul. That's all Paul. He brought that in. And I just went, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, Lucy and I was like, again, but that was one of them we said, what's this song about? And we tweaked the lyrics a little, but mm -hmm. Paul had that. And, and that was the first one that, to me, showed the magic of this team. Because I was like, okay, this blows me away. And as you say, it's kind of long, but it was what it was. The song wants to be what it wants to be. It's perfect for sync because they'll just take sections out of it and they'll put it in a TV show or a movie or yeah. commercial. But um, I, that was the first one that showed us the potential of the doll team to me. Right. Because huh. Paul brought that in as a finished product and then Lucy and I tweaked it to make sure that the listener would understand more of what, what it was about, but without disrupting the magic that Paul just sits yeah. down he, you know paul is, is sort of like a buddhist in this he'll say songs arrive like most people say i wrote that song and he'll say here's what arrived this morning as i was getting ready for our right we are fragile We are free We are broken in pieces But somehow your heart reaches me We are living Till we die Make the most of every moment Knowing that the time is flying by We are fragile But we are free We are moving We are still We are revolving around What spins around us And always will We are standing Until we fall But we pick ourselves back up Cause it's not luck but only love that saves us all Hearts will break And life will take a turn Islands fall and wash away But still we burn we burn 
Cause we are fragile But we are free We are broken into pieces But somehow your heart reaches me We are fragile But we are free We are fragile That's We Are Fragile, written by the Doll Group and performed again by Paul DeMarco. I really love that, that sense of you're obviously an active participant in it, but it comes through you and it comes to you and it's influenced by everything you've heard before. Like you say, the 68 years of listening to music and being a human and all that stuff. Paul is really good at being a channel for whatever comes through him. And then, then of course, then you get into the editing and the craft of the thing, yeah. you know, when you record it and when you tweak it. And it's, and you Paul, know, and Paul uh, can I ask you, do you remember how that song arrived to you? We are fragile. Yeah, absolutely. For me, that song was a real turning point because uh, during, during lockdown, um, for for performing musicians, the world stopped, you know, and and um, I'd kind of I was a window cleaner before, and then my my fiance had convinced me that I shouldn't be. She convinced me that I should be a full time musician. It's what I should be doing, and I have I have her to thank for that. Um, but then lockdown happened, and my gig stopped. Uh, I was getting some production work because people were writing, which was good. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the gigging and the teaching was was out the window, and so there's a there's a charity in the UK called Help Musicians, and they decided to try and help musicians to not have to go shelf stacking in the local local supermarket. Right. Let's try and keep these musicians working, and they gave us a, a little bit of money just to keep us going as well. It wasn't a lot, but it was something. But they uh, they invited us to join songwriting retreats online, and uh, the I was invited to this retreat, to apply for this retreat, which was run by um, Chris Difford from the UK band Squeeze. Now, he's an amazing songwriter. And, mm. you know, I, I didn't fully understand what was what was going to happen. And I ended up on this Zoom session where Chris was there in the uh, on the screen. And he was just putting us into writing teams, sending us off to go and write. And it was interesting that I'd it had kind of triggered something in me and it had got me writing again properly and feeling what I wrote. And I remember on the very last session, somebody asked Chris about the rules of songwriting. And I'd been writing with country writers and it's all about, it was all about the rules. It was like, you can't do that because you can't do that. You can't do that. So at the very end, Chris, uh, he's in his little writing room where he writes and somebody asked him about the rules and he went, oh, hang on a second. And he, and he turned around in his, in his little writing room and he got this little book and he, he held it up to the camera and he said, um, that's the, uh, that's the book of songwriting rules. And everyone went, oh, oh, he said, do you want to know what's in it? And we went, yeah. He said, I'm not going to tell you what in it. In fact, he said, and he tossed it over his shoulder into yeah. the back of the room. He said, when I write, I've learned the rules, but when I write, I don't think about the rules. I just write. And I was like, wow. And then the very next morning I I woke up and I wrote, we are fragile. I picked up my guitar and I thought, you know what? I'm just going to write, just going to write what I feel. And obviously the world was quite fragile and, and yet there was hope, you know, everybody was pulling together and things were kind of strengthening around us the world was like healing itself it was very strange circumstances i remember these videos of of dolphins in venice you know in the in the canals of venice and 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 we noticed that there were no airplane um lines in the sky it was just clear sky and the birds were alive and so I wrote, we are fragile. And I just sat down and I just wrote what I felt. And when, when I brought it in the next day to, to, to the right with, with Bill and Lucy, um, it was, it was a moment, you know, right. and, um, it was really good because I've learned the rules. We, we, we practice the rules, but then there comes a time where you put it in a drawer and go, okay, somebody's got to feel this. So now I've got to write this. Right. And that's what, 
from then on, I think that's what we really started doing. And now when we're in a room and we go, oh, we can't say that because blah, blah, blah. We look at each other and go, yeah, but it sounds good and it right. feels good. Yeah. So we do I, it. And I think that's where workshops and that kind of those kind of training sessions and being in a song town group or all this, the, the background work that you do to, quote, learn the rules is is quite valuable. You know, I mean, I've hosted Pat Patterson and various other people for workshops up here in Halifax. And uh, um, it's you get that stuff in the back of your mind. It's it's part of that uh, intelligence system that sits back there when you're writing and you, you get the creative urge and you let the, you let the creative take over for as long as you can while you craft the song and then you then you worry about the the the, the tools shall we say the yeah. the rules and the tools yeah yeah it's yeah. it's a good uh, it's a good thing to remind yourself to not put the rules and tools in place until you have something that has the emotion yeah, I, I had a, I had a really interesting moment with We Are Fragile just before just before we joined this Zoom. Um, I haven't played the song for a long time. You know, it's not the type of song I play at my gigs. I play to like crowded pubs and, you know, people want something they can sing along to or something upbeat, even if I do do my own songs. And so I just brought up the lyrics and I just played the song. And what I loved about it was I still felt it. Right. I could still feel that song like it was it was trickling through me and that was um that restored my faith in uh, in everything which was right. which was a nice feeling good right on well um i really appreciate your time you guys and i know that t- cutting into your writing time so i won't carry on i'll just i don't know if there's anything you guys want to say i know you have the writers workshop coming up online you've got some in the archives people can look into and well, I mean, yeah, I think that's one thing is that the three of us, we have this, you know, uh, in addition to being psychotically optimistic, we have this desire to give back to the world when we would learn something because you spend so much time trying to figure out how to do the songwriting thing mm-hmm. and then how to do the songwriting business part. Right. And, you know, how do you, we're really good and making sure the songs don't gather digital dust in our computers. And so we were like, okay, let's do a webinar because we are good at this. You've written a song you love. Now what? Now how, right. Where do you go next? Is it really a great song or have you fooled yourself? Right. And then what do you do if it's really a great song and you want to get it out in the world? Most people that we know don't do well at that. And we have gotten really good at that. I mean, Lucy's got hundreds of cuts. Paul's had so many songs recorded and released. I've had, you know, 120 something. And I just, I started after these two. Um, But, you know, it's, it's important if you love that, that song to get it out in the world and not just have it sit on your computer or your family and friends are the only ones who hear it, which is right. fine if that's your goal. But if you want to get your song out so it changes the world and moves the world and expresses that emotion, we want to help people figure that out. Great. That's our next. Great. Yeah. Well, I will forward as many people as I can into your bucket. <laughs> Great. Great. Cool. Thank you. Now, you've also got a couple of exclusive on that list as well, Robert, if you use them. Um, uh, Daddy-O and So Wonderfully Weird hasn't been released yet. All the other songs have, okay. have been released, so Great. they're unreleased. So Daddy-O, the, the, the only song with Lucy LeBlanc as an artist on it. Lucy is on that, singing. Oh, are you singing in the- <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, we'll tell you that quick story before we go. And that is one time, as Lucy does, she'll send a whole lyric, but she doesn't usually send a melody thing. And she just sent this voice memo that she was walking around and this occurred to her. And right. she just started saying, Daddy O, Daddy O, Daddy O, Daddy O. You know, and she said, maybe there's something we can make something out of that. Right. Paul and I went wild and we're like, yes. And so we wrote the song <laughs> to it. And Paul put Lucy's thing. And she was like, no, I I no, you, you you're gonna do some somebody else is gonna sing that part, right? And Paul and I looked at each other and we're like, no. Mm-hmm way are we going to let anyone else sing that that is perfect it's perfect yeah. and she's 
Oh, I don't know. She wasn't comfortable. Now she's yeah. proud of it. She's happy yeah. with it, partly because she's played it for music supervisors, and they're like, wow, I love that. Oh, so cool. She's got more <laughs> so she's so got I, more I, 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 I use the voice note because it it made right. it sound it sound like a sample from like the fifties or sixties, oh, like an right. old vinyl sample right. on the voice note. And right. so, um, yeah, so we've sampled Lucy. <laughs> but we, yeah, we haven't put that on the world yet, so that's an exclusive. What's the well, other one? That's exclusive, Paul. Uh, so Thank wonderfully you. weird's the other exclusive. But wonderfully weird. It hasn't been put out yet. So, and, and you know, with the beauty of technology these days, even if you were a little sharp or flat through the thing, uh, Paul probably made a miracle out of it. You guys could be doing it in different key. <laughs> be great. <laughs> I'd say I didn't have to tune Lucy at all. No, oh, he, that, right? he built the track around that. He built the whole thing around that. So wow, that, that's great. Yeah. That was the song. I've heard her sing. You know, you have. Room. Yeah, well, just uh -oh. the, I've heard the voice that I've, in the room, you know, in the writing room. Uh, occasionally, she'll she'll do a note or two, but right. she's very reluctant most of I know, the time. But I know that she has a nice voice, right? So, well, I think we'll make progress when she gets the piano off from under her bed and I hear her play piano. <laughs> she said it's not going to happen, but <laughs> I, I'm a psychotic optimist and I hold out hope. <laughs> That's Paul DeMarco singing Soul Revival, and of course, written by the Doll Group. That's it. We're good. I'm I'm really appreciative of your time, and, and who knows, maybe we'll write someday. And any of you get to the east coast of Canada, 
You have uh, a venue. You have a place That's, to stay. Robert, I wanted to say, too, you know, occasionally I do a free thing for songwriting groups, and that is on part of my uh, melody writing uh, book with Clay. It's called the Line Plus Three Method, and I right. just do a, a presentation on that. I'd be happy to do that sometime for your group if you want. Okay, we've reached the end of the podcast version of the show, and again, thank you very much for being here. Since you're hearing this, if you reach out to me, the first person who contacts me via email, songwriters at sfhaa.ca, will get their choice of a free ticket to a show that we're producing in Halifax or a collection of CDs from various artists that I have. So here's one last little piece from the recording that we did. Just something that I found rather interesting. Lucy, between you guys, you write about 8 billion songs a year. <laughs> and, and Lucy, you should tell them maybe the story of how our song coopetition came about. All right. Yeah, you guys competing for who who, who is writing the most songs. I, I noticed that that's downplayed a little bit now. but <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Bill, uh, Bill is competitive in a nice way. Right. And I, I really, I don't remember why you and I started that uh, well, competition. I, I do, but I wanted to tell the story. But let me tell that part of the story, and then you can go back. Well, I used to see Lucy's social media posts, which I'm sure you see. And yeah. she's really good at putting out there what she's up to. And I was sort of new to the songwriting business. And I saw, I kept seeing Lucy's posts. And one year, she she posted i wrote a hundred songs last year and i was like wow i've never even counted how many songs i've written but a hundred songs i you know and i went back and counted what i'd written the year before and i'd written 40 songs and i thought wow that's something to aspire to what lucy's doing i'd like to be like lucy when i grow up and then the next year i decided i really worked at it i wrote a hundred songs at like 102 or something and Lucy posted at the end of that year, I wrote 150 songs this year. And I thought, ah. <laughs> and then the next year, I wrote 153 songs. And Lucy posted, I wrote 200 songs this year. And I'm like, I will never catch up with Lucy yeah. LeBlanc. I just, just, but she's good, you know, because she's like the, the pace rabbit, you know, for the, for the races, for the dogs. That and I right. would pace that. And the next year, we'd start writing together a fair amount. In January, like late January, we were on a, a call together. And I said, oh, you probably way ahead of me, you know, this this month, you know, because I, I aspire someday to be Lucy LeBlanc and catch up with you. And she said, oh, no, I've had a bunch of cancellations and um, I've only written 11 songs. And I thought, I've written 20 songs this year already. And I was like, I'm going to savor this brief moment when I'm ahead of Lucy LeBlanc. She goes, oh, well, would you like to have a little friendly competition this year? See who writes it. I grew up in a really competitive family. I don't like to do competition, but yes. She goes, okay. Well, she said it would really help me get back on the horse and get going and make sure, you know, I get my songs done. Yeah. So we had a competition that year and, I will. I'll let Lucy take the story from there. Well, it just seemed that, uh, uh, and we kind of did friendly sniping at one another. You know what I mean? Right. You know. And uh, uh, Bill would post, "Oh, I'm at 15." I said, "Well, watch out! I'm right behind you. You know, I've got 13 new ones." And you know, and and people related to this, like we were just doing this back and forth, back and forth, and people were watching it and. Uh, oh, look at this. But it was a friendly competition. And Bill put out all the stops. He beat me fair and square the whole year. The next year, Paul came in on the competition as well. And we were screwed because Paul, even though he has a full-time job, family, he wrote way more songs. He wrote over 400 songs that year. Lucy and I did pretty well. We were in the 300s. But nowhere close to Paul. Yeah. And we, we sent Paul a little trophy because he won it that year. 
yeah. I'm looking. I'm looking hard on the back wall, Paul. I, I don't see the trophy up in the studio. Uh, here. That's be, that's because it's in pride of place in my living room. It's a oh. it's a fa- it's a family affair. So it's it's, it's on the mantelpiece in my living here's room. Here's mine from the previous year. <laughs> it's a, oh, fantastic! That's great. Well, um, 